today we're talking about getting into cells, attachment and entry. And uh, the, the problem here, of course, is that viruses need to get into cells to replicate, right? They're obligate intracellular parasites, but they can't simply diffuse through the membrane. They're too big. And so there have to be active ways that the viruses are taken up into cells. So that's going to be one aspect of what we're talking about today. And the other part of the equation is that, remember, virions are metastable. They are stable in the environment, but on some cue, they come apart and give up their genome. And that's going to play a big role in today, in today's discussion. We're going to talk about how metastability is used to get uh, viruses into cells. Now, viruses are floating around in the air, in fluids. They contact you. Let's say they get into your respiratory tract. They're diffusing and moving around. And their, their collision with a cell is purely by chance. Because they are inanimate. They have no means of moving around. They have no locomotion. They're driven by diffusion, Brownian motion, electrostatics. And they can bind anything in your respiratory tract or your intestine. They can bind food. Uh, they can bind mucus many different things. And that's why numbers of viruses are important for initiating an infection. It, usually you don't start an infection with just one because there's so much uh, other stuff that bi viruses can bind to. But <clears throat> in order to initiate an infection, they have to bind to the right cell. And that starts with adhering to the surface nonspecifically, simply through electrostatic interactions. And then seeing if that cell has a receptor on the surface to which uh, the virus can specifically bind. So there are lots of initial collisions between viruses and cells. Uh, and at some point, the, one of those collisions uh, ends up in the virus interacting with a specific receptor. So we're going to take a little time now and talk about receptor molecules for viruses. Uh, sometimes there is one receptor for a virus. Sometimes there's more than one. It really depends on the virus. And then the next step is to transfer the genome into the cell. <clears throat> and that can happen at a number of places depending on the virus. And as always, we'll try and simplify all the different things that happen and look at some unifying principles. Now, for all viruses that we will talk about, they require cellular receptors to initiate infection. The exceptions are some viruses of yeasts that don't actually have extracellular phases. They go from yeast to yeast as the cell divides. So they don't need to have a receptor on the cell surface. And some plants, well, plant viruses in general uh, don't bind to receptors, but rather get into the cell by mechanical damage, the breaking of the cell, or an insect bringing the virus into the cell. But we're not going to talk much about those in this course. We're talking mainly about animal viruses and uh, mammalian viruses and bacteriophages that bind to receptors. And there are what we call receptors and co-receptors. This is really an accident of discovery. Usually the first protein that a virus needs to get into the cell is called a receptor. And then the second one is called a co-receptor. So for HIV, you'll see receptor and co-receptor. But really, they both deserve to be receptors. So even though the, name, the words are in the literature, I'm not sure they mean so much. As late as 1985, we only knew one virus receptor. That was sialic acid or influenza virus, and we'll talk about that a bit today. But uh, right after that year, there was a lot of progress in the field. The, the availability of monoclonal antibodies, recombinant uh, DNA technology and cloning, DNA-mediated transformation, all of these pushed the field forward. And now we know many, many virus receptors, and th they seem to be identified every month. So here are some picornavirus receptors. These are receptors for viruses of my favorite virus family. And you can see they're all displayed on the plasma membrane. They're different kinds. There are some that have these domains which are called immunoglobulin-like domains. If you're familiar with the antibody molecule, it has a so-called Ig domain in it, and that's what these little loops are. And there are a number of virus receptors that, that are members of that protein family. But you can see there are all sorts of surface proteins that are virus receptors. There are some that are GPI-linked. Uh, Low-density lipoprotein receptor involved in cholesterol metabolism is a receptor for a virus. And vi uh, molecules from the immune system, these integrins. The bottom line here is that almost every cell 
kind of cell surface protein can be a receptor for a virus. And of course, they don't exist for viruses, right? It's the first thing you have to remember. These receptors weren't placed there so that viruses could attach to them. They happen to be normal cell proteins with their own functions, and viruses have evolved to bind to different ones. Some viruses bind more than one receptor, and sometimes one receptor binds uh, more than one virus. So for example, there is a receptor on the cell called CAR, C-A-R, and it stands for Coxsackie and adenovirus receptor. And that is because it can bind either of these two viruses. They're very different viruses. Remember, adenovirus is the icosahedral virus with the fibers coming out. And you'll see those fibers are what bind the receptor. And Coxsackie is also icosahedral, but it has no fibers. Yet they bind the Coxsackie adenovirus receptor. Coxsackie virus, by the way, is named after Coxsackie, New York. It's exit 21B on the New York State Thruway. It was named there because it was an outbreak in the 40s, which was thought to be polio, and it turned out to be a different virus, so they named it after the town. Uh, a swine herpes virus called pseudorabies virus happens to bind the same receptor as polio virus. These are two totally different viruses. Herpes viruses are enveloped, polio virus is not, yet they bind the same receptor. And viruses of the same family may bind different receptors. Rhinoviruses, there are three different receptors at least for rhinoviruses. Retroviruses, at least 16 different receptors. It's remarkable diversity. So there are lots of variations in virus receptor interactions. That's the point of all this. So let's talk about how viruses attach to receptors first. And we'll consider two different kinds of viruses, the viruses with icosahedral capsids and then envelope viruses because they bind in different ways. So here is how poliovirus binds to its receptor. On the upper left is the icosahedral capsid of polio. And you notice these things that are sticking out of the capsid. Uh, those are the receptor molecules. So what's been done here is the receptor protein has been produced in a soluble form. That is not bound to the plasma membrane. As you remember perhaps from a few slides ago, most of these receptor proteins are transmembrane proteins, right? So the poliovirus receptor, this one was produced by making a version without the transmembrane domain. Then it was mixed with virus, and so each receptor molecule is binding the virus. And then the, stru the structure was solved by cryo electron microscopy and image reconstruction. So it's a low resolution structure, but you can see very clearly individual receptor molecules binding to the capsid. And what's really interesting is that around each five-fold axis of symmetry, here's one five-fold axis right there, there are one, two, three, four, five receptor molecules. That's what five-fold means, right? There are five copies of the protein subunit around it. And in fact, you would predict that there would be 60 copies of the receptor bound because of icosahedral symmetry, and that's in fact what you get. This is saturated with receptor. You can tell which end of the receptor is fitting in here. There happen to be sugar groups on the receptor, so you can orient it by those bumps. And basically the way this receptor fits into the virus particle is shown here on the right, upper right. Here's a cross section of the virus, uh, and here's the receptor fitting in. There is a little uh, depression on the surface of the virus particle. Some people call it a canyon, and it, that's just where the receptor fits in. Of course, there are interactions between the receptor amino acids and the virus. These are not covalent, right? These are just other kinds of non-covalent interactions. So that's polio. Here's rhinovirus, which is a member of the same family. It's an icosahedral virus. The receptor for this kind of rhino is low-density lipoprotein receptor. And again, in this picture, a soluble form of that receptor was produced and bound to virus. And here you see it binds to a different place. Uh, it's binding up on what we call the plateau. So there is also a plateau in polio. It would be right here at the five-fold axis. And if this on the upper right were rhinovirus, the receptor would be binding right up there. Uh, so the rhinovirus binds there. It doesn't bind in the canyon. So you see there are lots of places where receptors can bind on these ca capsids, canyons, uh, or on the surface as well. So those are icosahedral viruses. Now, how about an envelope virus? Influenza virus is a great model to use for this. Remember, influenza is an envelope virus with 
a couple of different kinds of proteins in the envelope. The two major ones are the hemagglutinin, the HA, and the neuraminidase. The HA is the molecule, it's the purple one here, it's in most numbers. It's the molecule that attaches to the cell receptor. For all influenza viruses, the cell receptor is a sugar. It's a, it's a molecule of sialic acid and the virus binds to it. And we're going to look at that in some detail. So sialic acids are typically part of glycoproteins on cells, often on the cell surface. In fact, every one of our cells on our body has sialic acid in some form on it. It's typically the last sugar on the chain of sugars that's attached to a protein. So here's a glycoprotein here on the upper left and a glycoprotein ha has sugar chains attached to it. And when sialic acid is present, it's only, always terminal. It's always the last sugar. And sialic acid is the, sh is the receptor for influenza virus. So in fact, if you make soluble sialic acid, it will bind influenza virus by itself. But it, when a vi virus infects a cell, of course, it's recognizing sialic acid on a glycoprotein. So here is sialic acid here uh, on the top. This is the, it's a six carbon sugar, of course, with side groups of various sorts. Another name for it is N-acetylneuraminic acid, right, sialic acid. And depending on what, the way it is linked to the second sugar in the chain, uh, it determines the specificity for different kinds of influenza viruses. So here is an alpha-2-3 linkage between the two sugars. It can also be linked in an alpha-2-6 manner to this six carbon via uh, 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 an oxygen bond there as well. All right, so influenza viruses will bind to either sialic acids linked alpha-2-3 or SU-2-6. Our respiratory tracts have largely alpha-2-6 sialic <coughs> acids in the upper and lower tract. And human influenza viruses like that we have alpha-2-3 in our lower tract, though, not much in our upper tract. And avian influenza virus strains prefer alpha-2-3-linked sialic acids. And this is one reason why it's not so easy to be infected with avian influenza virus strains, because the receptors are way down in your lungs. And you have to inhale pretty deeply a large aerosol in order to be infected. But it does happen, and you may know that occasionally people die of influenza H5N1, which is an avian strain that binds alpha-2-3. We'll talk more about that later. It's a very interesting story. So here's the crystal structure or the x-ray structure of the hemagglutinin of flu. Again, this is a glycoprotein on the surface of the particle that attaches to the cell receptor. Uh, it's embedded in the viral membrane. It's a transmembrane protein. It has a fibrous stem and at the top is a globular head and the head contains the sialic acid binding site. And in fact, here is a structure of sialic acid in yellow bound in the head of the hemagglutinin. So we know exactly how it sits in there. We know all the kinds of interactions between the sialic acid and specific amino acid residues of the hemagglutinin. Uh, adenovirus, remember the odd looking icosahedron with the fibers? The very tip of the fiber has a knob protein on it. Right there, you can see it. And that, by, that is shown right here, uh, and that interacts with the cellular receptor on the cell surface. <laughs>